So um, hello everyone, uh, as Per said, I'm Sebastian, and I've been uh, presenting before at uh, Oslo, Trondheim, Cambridge, and very happy to be here this year in Bochum. Um, so this talk, uh, as Per was saying, it's about VPNs, but uh, not exactly, and uh, it's a good example because um, the reason I'm doing this talk is nothing new, so hopefully I'm not boring anyone to death, but uh, at the same time, it's also something that I see again and again is not known um, in uh, the public domain, not known enough. So again, I was doing security consulting uh, recently and uh, it would have solved, uh, or at least seriously slowed me down, but uh, in a matter of days, uh, I was a domain admin on many networks, etc., and it, it was too easy. So uh, hopefully uh, what I present you today will help you avoid uh, that kind of uh, attacks. So uh, in case you don't know already those uh, abbreviations, um, a wide area network is just a big network, like uh, typically between universities or different uh, branch offices of a company. But also you might see uh, on your home Wi-Fi uh, modem router, et cetera, it says one port. So um, it's one definition of it. And uh, unfortunately, then uh, often people uh, understand it as the internet, it's just the port to the bigger side of the network. Uh, then you have on a smaller scale, a local network, like your home network or a small business uh, network. And uh, you can recognize them um, or often uh, they are called uh, LAN in uh, meaning a private network. So all those IP addresses starting, uh, you know, with, like you would have at home, typically 192, 168, uh, and so on. And uh, the 10 dot something is for the uh, bigger uh, networks, so mostly ones, but why not? You can also use it at home, I do. Uh, then lately, especially in terms of uh, wearables and uh, people carrying around a 3G a dongle uh, to uh, have internet for their phone and laptop and everything, uh, there's a term of uh, personal area network, but it's basically the same as a uh, LAN. It's just uh, the idea is uh, just for you, it's that it's just for you. Uh, the thing is, uh, unfortunately, when you look at uh, all that and especially uh, um, uh, all these new trends of uh, Internet of Things and um, uh, everything in the cloud. So you have uh, everything that's uh, supposedly more convenient for you, like your printer, for example, uh, HP is uh, offering you to manage it for you, even uh, not uh, in terms of business, but for a home user. You don't have to worry about going to the shop for getting uh, ink anymore. The printer is connected to their network, even though it's in your bedroom, for example, or office room. Uh, so uh, technically, it becomes part of their network. And you don't realize you have all these uh, devices in your home network that are actually part of bigger networks. And uh, lately, for example, uh, you might have heard of a big uh, denial of service attack that was performed by uh, hacked uh, cameras. Um, so people were installing those cameras in their backyard or entrance or whatever to survey what was going on. But those actually were part of uh, what's called a botnet, a large attack network or hacker network. Um, and then you have uh, all kinds of uh, other considerations, especially uh, as a company, um, in terms of uh, disgruntled employees or contractors coming uh, in and out and uh, all that new um, trend of uh, bring your own device. So it, uh, there's really no private network anymore. It's uh, too many stakeholders. So uh, my point is that uh, you should consider all of them wide area networks anyway. And uh, the one in the middle, uh, also perhaps you don't realize, uh, it's an especially tricky one uh, when you have guests uh, at your home and uh, they ask you access to your Wi-Fi. So maybe you have split between your personal Wi-Fi and the guest Wi-Fi. But um, you have technologies, um, especially with Apple and Google, all the Wi-Fi passwords are saved uh, in their cloud so that uh, when you configure a different device, maybe you just bought an iPad, it already knows all of that that you have configured in your uh, iPhone, for example. But even further, uh, what Microsoft uh, had started doing, but then they had to revert uh, that or not do it by default because people were, uh, in, uh, uh, were really angry about it, is uh, that it would share, for example, if you give access to your Wi-Fi to a friend, 
then automatically within their social network, your Wi-Fi password would be also shared with their friends. So it's, you're really losing control of your network, basically. So um, I don't know who is uh, very familiar with networking, so hopefully um, I, don't, uh, it's, I don't bore people, but uh, it's a quick uh, overview of basically how, what happens uh, when you go and uh, download software from download.com, which is apparently one of the most popular places to download Windows software. Um, so what's going to happen is uh, basically you will need all that uh, information uh, in green. Otherwise, uh, your computer, uh, I'll get uh, into it, but uh, you already have your own MAC address and um, the rest uh, is uh, not important. So basically, you need to know where is the router, uh, what is your own IP address, which is not something you carry with you. It will be different uh, in the network here than in your network at home, for example, and uh, where to send that uh, request of a download exactly. So uh, first, uh, you would have uh, this uh, DHCP protocol uh, that uh, you use uh, all the time, perhaps without uh, rea realizing, which uh, gives you typically an IP address and um, uh, the um, addresses of the servers for name resolution and uh, default gateway. Um, but um, those uh, things are much more powerful. You can make um, computers uh, boot a special uh, uh, different operating systems, so for example, uh, typically backup solutions in enterprises would reboot computers at night and uh, boot into a separate operating system uh, to do the backup and so on. Uh, and other uh, informations that I'll uh, get back into uh, later, but uh, uh, keep in mind this uh, web proxy and uh, static routes, so, for example. And uh, also there's uh, an older one, boot P, uh, which is similar to DHCP basically. So um, then let's say now you have an IP address uh, on the network, but um, you don't really know if that network is directly connected to the internet or uh, if you have to use a proxy. Uh, it used to be the case, especially in the beginning of uh, public internet access, uh, but it's still very much the case in companies. Uh, for some reason, many companies still use proxies, maybe for um, uh, content filtering, so blocking access to certain, ki certain kinds of uh, websites, etc. So it's sort of um, not complicated, but uh, not the most user friendly. Um, if uh, you, once you have connected, then you have to configure different settings, etc. So um, web browsers, especially uh, Microsoft and Netscape uh, back then, have invented this uh, web proxy auto discovery protocol which uh, is enabled by default in uh, uh, basically all the browsers and other software like VirtualBox. And it's exactly what happens when you see that little box checked uh, on the left, on the left uh, automatically detects settings. And technically what happens, um, your computer on the network is uh, continuously asking, uh, is there someone called WPAD? using uh, different uh, protocols uh, to find that uh, WPAD computer. So here it's a NetBIOS name resolution, and um, the other one is a link local multicast name resolution, or it would use DNS and all kinds of uh, things. But um, note also how often it does it. It does it uh, pretty much several times per second. And uh, in this case, there was no WPAD server to answer, so it just continues trying. And that's what all your computers are doing right now. Then um, let's say you have found uh, a way, maybe you're directly connected to the internet or you have to use a proxy, you got all that information. So now you type download.com. Uh, but to your computer, that doesn't really mean anything. So what it does first is uh, it tries to find how to use that uh, human name into an IP address. Um, so I guess everyone's pretty much familiar with IP addresses, but um, um, basically it's sort of a, like a phone book. You get download.com and it gives you an IP address, uh, this one in, in this case, or an IPv6, for example. Uh, Facebook has a funny one with Facebook in it. Um, and uh, also you have uh, other protocols uh, automatically in a local network when um, at home, for example, you have probably not configured your own DNS server, you don't want to, to configure it all the time to say my iPhone is this IP address and my Xbox is this IP address, etc. So they have um, 
automatic uh, configuration with various uh, multicast or broadcast protocols like these MDNS and uh, DNSSD, LLM, and out, which is the one I was showing uh, in WPAD earlier. Uh, and that's how, for example, when you have your own iPhone to which you give a name, uh, for example, John Doe in this case, then automatically it creates a John Doe's iPhone.local, and that uh, automatically pro, um, broadcasts its uh, name and IP address, basically. And um, n those are compatible with DNS, um, and NetBIOS uh, name resolution uh, called uh, the Windows Internet Name Service, also in uh, Windows uh, networks, is uh, Technically not the same, but it's the same idea. You ask it a, a domain name and it gives you an IP address uh, if it exists. So, well, um, everyone knows what's an IP address. Uh, so in this case, a printer, for example. And um, then uh, you use them to communicate between different <coughs> networks. So, of course, it works within your own network as well, if you're communicating between your computer and your printer or your phone or whatever. But uh, also, it depends. Uh, it will work from your home network to the other side of the internet. Um, sorry. Uh, the problem is also uh, that uh, within a network, so while an IP address uh, works from one uh, computer to any other computer on the internet, um, technically at the lowest layer directly to reach that computer across the cable, it's still not sufficient. You need uh, uh, a MAC address. Uh, and typically, or uh, other kinds of uh, protocols, but uh, most likely a MAC address. <coughs> and uh, for that you have the DNS equivalent, uh, so DNS translates a name into an IP, and then ARP translates an IP into a um, physical address. So that's uh, how you would have, for example, this uh, printer's IP address uh, would become this kind of uh, thing. So uh, MAC address you find uh, typically, for example, at the back of your Wi-Fi router, it would have two different ones because it has both a wireless interface, so you have to know how to communicate to that particular uh, network card, or uh, maybe you want to communicate to the uh, wired card of that uh, same router, so it's two different uh, MAC addresses. And um, so you will uh, use them within the network to communicate either directly with the target computer if uh, you were trying to reach this printer within the same network, for example. But it's also how it works when you are trying to go to download.com or Google or whatever. Um, you send an, a packet that has the destination of uh, Google, but it, this uh, destination of Google does not exist in your network. It's just being sent to the MAC address of your gateway here. So that's how uh, the packet starts its journey. It's being sent directly to your router and so on. So that's uh, the very basics of uh, how it's all working. There's uh, nothing uh, special about that. But uh, it also works very well as long as hackers don't start messing with it. So how do you uh, prevent uh, that? And uh, then you have to go back into basics of crypto, or uh, I don't know any other way of how to make sure that you're not communicating with the wrong person, and how to make sure that uh, you're not letting the wrong person eavesdrop, overhear your conversation, or see your traffic. It's the same, basically. So uh, very basics uh, of uh, crypto. Um, the symmetric one is the one that uh, everyone is fa uh, familiar with, even as uh, children. For example, uh, if you are in a classroom, maybe you are trying to send uh, messages that you don't want the teacher to intercept. So you would use um, a variant, basically, of this uh, Caesar cipher, where you're uh, rotating letters and that kind of stuff. Uh, but that only works, it's called symmetric, because you have to agree with your friend in advance that uh, all your letters will be rotated 13. For example, the typical one is called ROT13. So um, it's very simple, but it also poses 
a logistics problem because uh, then, for example, if you want to communicate with other friends in the same class and you don't want them to be able to see the messages with your first friend, so you have to agree with each different friend for a different uh, key, etc. So it becomes difficult very quickly. And of course, you wouldn't do that with your bank. Where, uh, or you could do it with your bank, for example, if you went to the branch and agreed on a key for your banking transactions, but you wouldn't do it for every secure website on the internet, you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook, whatever. Would you go to the Facebook headquarters to agree on a secret key with them? Probably not. So what's uh, really useful is then uh, asymmetric uh, crypto, which is um, a concept where instead of having one secret, um, one uh, key that is shared between uh, the both parties, you, each party uh, generates two keys, one that is private and one that is public. And then you can give uh, the public key to even the whole internet if you want, uh, as long as you keep, uh, of course, the private part private. Uh, and uh, then the way it works is uh, you send something um, to encrypt uh, for, some, for a friend of yours, for example, you encrypt uh, to them with uh, their public key uh, so that they are able to decrypt what you sent with the corresponding private key. And then when they want to reply, so for example, in email typically, they would uh, then uh, write to you, encrypt with your own public key, and then you can decrypt that with your private key and so on. So then um, this is easy to understand for humans, but it works just as well uh, for computers, devices, etc. So here you can, can be anyone or anything, can encrypt for anything with uh, access public key, and then um, it decrypts with their own private key. And um, so, sorry, the previous one, symmetric crypto, yeah, you must have heard of AES. It's a typical, typically used nowadays for symmetric crypto. And the one typically used uh, nowadays um, for asymmetric is RSA, or also Diffie-Hellman um, on HTTPS, etc. cetera. Uh, a really cool thing you can also do with asymmetric crypto and it's recommended to not use the same keys for both purposes of encrypting and signing, but uh, nothing, technically it's possible. Um, so anyway, you can also do digital signatures, which um, allows you, it's much better than a handwritten signature that's so easy to forge if uh, you're quite good at copying uh, someone's signature. Whereas here you can, uh, publish anything and you add a signature as you would a human signature below it that everyone can verify that uh, you wrote. Um, but uh, of course the idea is you don't want anyone else to forge that uh, signature. So for example, that's uh, what is in your passport most likely. Uh, you have uh, all kinds of information about uh, your photo, your height, your first name, last name, etc. And uh, then what happens is the, for example, I'm French, and the French government applied a digital signature to this uh, passport information so that uh, all the other countries I go to can verify that uh, my passport was made by the French government and not forged by myself or whoever. Um, but uh, they don't have to reveal to the Americans or whatever other government what their private key is. However, all the other governments of uh, all countries around the world can verify uh, that uh, signature. So, um, a slight problem with that, um, with the asymmetric crypto, is um, if, um, if you are not sure uh, exactly uh, who was uh, processing the public key in the beginning. So ideally, for example, Alice and Bob here would meet in person and uh, Alice uh, gives Bob her public key and vice versa. But uh, on the internet, uh, no one has uh, time, etc. We want this to happen uh, quickly, especially with all the w secure websites you visit, etc. So um, you have to find a way of knowing that, uh, for example, I am not between Alice and Bob telling Alice, uh, Yes, here is Bob, Bob's public key, which is in fact my public key. And then I would tell Bob, here is Alice's public key, which is also my public key. And then they are both happy thinking that everything is encrypted, but I'm actually um, decrypting everything and re-encrypting on the other side. So in order to find how to um, prevent that, 
there's a whole thing called the public key infrastructure where everyone agrees uh, on a limited number of uh, trusted third parties. So, for example, you might have heard of uh, GlobalSign, VeriSign, Digicert, and all those things that uh, your browsers and operating systems know about, um, which is how, for example, when you connect to Wikipedia, which is uh, using HTTPS now, uh, your computer doesn't, uh, especially if you have never visited before, it doesn't know anything about Wikipedia. So uh, how does it uh, verify that um, um, the public key that you are given, pretending to be the public key of wikipedia.org, is actually really the original one? So what happens is uh, you have a certificate, it's simply, uh, oh, it's a bit more complicated of course, but uh, you can think of it as a public key with some information about it. So saying, for example, this is the public key for anything on wikipedia.org, and it, it is digitally signed by um, someone that uh, you or your computer already trusts. So in this case, for example, for Wikipedia, it's a global sign. So, uh, like I said, your computer doesn't know anything about Wikipedia, but then it recognizes the digital signature of global sign and it says, oh, okay, so I can trust that. And uh, what's really nice about that also is that you can scale it. So, for example, uh, those uh, really global certification authorities like global sign, um, you would go one level under them, but if you do your own network or your own um, well, uh, PKI for all purposes, so not necessarily just uh, encryption, but also you can use it for code signing, etc. So you would have a root certification authority which, um, for which you would keep the private key very safe, so you would even put it in a physical safe because you rarely need to use it anyway. Um, and then uh, you make it so that uh, it has vouched for, so it has uh, written its uh, digital signature onto the certificates of uh, several sub-certification authorities. So, for example, you could have one for network encryption, one for email encryption, and one for code signing. So, for example, um, when you make programs, you can apply your digital signature so that people installing your program are uh, more convinced that the program came from, from you. And then um, uh, you can go several levels down, saying that, for example, the Network Encryption uh, Certification Authority would uh, split between the clients and the servers and so on. So, uh, of course, not everything is perfect. So, uh, there's some uh, pros and cons. The symmetric one, like I said, um, it poses a logistics problem, but uh, to its advantage, it's really fast and uh, very simple. So, it's even considered somehow more secure than uh, asymmetric keys, that uh, asymmetric crypto. That's why also you have uh, symmetric keys that are usually shorter. So like 128 bits or 256 bits in symmetric is uh, corresponding to much larger keys in uh, asymmetric, like uh, 1024, <coughs> 2048, et cetera, um, because the um, asymmetric one is much more simple. So it's much faster, but it poses a, a logistics problem. Then the asymmetric one is uh, great for logistics because you don't have to know um, the public key or you don't have to have uh, agreed on anything with Facebook before the first time that you connect to them. Uh, but it's also very slow, very complicated, etc. So uh, what happens most of the time is uh, that you would use asymmetric uh, as a first step to agree on a secret uh, shared key that, that uh, can also be temporary. So that's also increased security so that uh, you would use a different one for each connection, for example. Um, and from there on, with that uh, agreed uh, symmetric key, you can do fast uh, crypto. And um, also, uh, having a such a symmetric key agreed with the different parties that didn't know each other in the beginning, but uh, thanks to asymmetric encryption can agree on the secret, you can have also something called the message authentic authentication codes, which is um, like digital signatures, but much shorter and much quicker to do. Because uh, as I was saying before, the digital signatures, it's a variant of uh, asymmetric encryption. So it's also really slow. And uh, you don't want, for example, when you are 
um, sending uh, packets, encrypted packets on the network. You don't want each packet to be delayed uh, a long time while uh, each computer is uh, signing the packet and uh, the receiver is verifying the signature, etc. So what uh, we do is a little trick where uh, we make much shorter things that are apparent to signatures, but um, actually using symmetric crypto so much faster. And uh, to give you an example, so you would uh, use in the first case RSA to agree uh, um, using, so RSA is the asymmetric one that gives you the possibility to agree on a symmetric key. So that's what you use with AES. And then for integrity, you would use um, hashing algorithm that you might recognize here, the SHA-256. Um, so it's basically hashing and um, encrypting with the secret that uh, both parties know, but uh, that an attacker wouldn't know. And uh, you might notice it says 128 at the end. It's because it's so good in a way that um, it's different for each packet. So maybe a hacker would be able to crack the signature on just one packet after spending days uh, working on it, but uh, it's already too late. The next packet is using something different, etc. So it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. And you can even shorten it, make it smaller than SHA-256 would have an output of 256 bits, but you can even half it and uh, it's still uh, secure enough. And that saves you from having uh, for example, you wouldn't want a lot of your 3G data plan um, paying money for just a, a bigger hash here if uh, half of the hash is just as good. So uh, going back to our installation from download.com, uh, uh, how do we prevent a hacker from messing with it? Uh, so typically in companies, you would have uh, something, uh, unfortunately not most often, uh, switch partitioning is uh, basically splitting physically uh, or as if it were two different uh, switches or more different switches, etc. Uh, but unfortunately, most of the time, what people refer to by VLANs, virtual lines, is something called 802.1Q, which is um, a logical layer. Uh, it's also called sometimes a VLAN tag. And that's quite nice for... Um, doing some network separations between, for example, if you have VOIP phones and you want them to have a higher priority than the computer um, traffic so that, uh, for example, if someone starts a big download, it doesn't uh, mess with, uh, it doesn't kill everyone's uh, telephone communications. But it's really not a security feature. It's a, you can uh, hack around it. So uh, another thing they could do to prevent a, a hacker from uh, accessing the network. So sorry, I should have said on that first slide, the idea is that uh, a hacker shouldn't be able to just uh, pull a, a network cable and access everything. So maybe you have done some partitioning that says, for example, if I took the cable from a printer, I should be only able to mess with the printers. That would be already better than being able to mess with the whole network. Uh, then you have something uh, called port-based access control where um, with different ways. So you have the MAC uh, whitelisting, uh, which is uh, in Cisco parlance called port security, which is just checking um, if uh, the MAC address, so the physical network address coming at the other end of the cable is uh, part of a whitelist. And uh, as uh, someone was mentioning uh, uh, this morning in the talk, uh, it's um, easily spoofed. Uh, as you can see, I did it uh, here. You, on Linux, you just need a command called Mac changer. Then you put whatever Mac address you want. And uh, also that uh, in Mac addresses, the first three bytes are um, actually assigned to different organizations. So for example, here, the 5C260A belongs to Dell so that they can create lots of network cards and uh, put uh, whatever serial number at the end and uh, without risking conflicting with another manufacturer. And uh, there's a funny range, this uh, 002091, which belongs to the NSA. So hopefully they don't use MAC whitelisting to make sure that no one accesses their network because you just need to do that to look like a NSA computer. Then another um, port-based uh, access control uh, system is 802.1x. Uh, which uh, I strongly believe was uh, 
plot uh, by um, the manufacturers to get you to renew your network equipment because maybe all the companies had already bought the nicest uh, gigabit gear, etc., and it's all working perfectly, but uh, we need to make more money, so we invent uh, this new uh, thing or we market the fact that it's going to solve all your security problems when, in fact, it's actually useless. Um, however, it requires replacing all your switches, so it's quite good in terms of uh, sales. Uh, what happens exactly is that uh, when you connect um, to a switch that uh, has 802.1x enabled, it's going to send you a challenge to say, okay, prove that you are a computer that's uh, allowed to connect to this port. Uh, and as a hacker, maybe you don't have the necessary information to respond to that challenge, but nothing stops you from forwarding that challenge to a, a legitimate computer that's already part of the network or a printer or something like that. Uh, and uh, especially, for example, this is a uh, gumsticks um, embedded uh, computer. Uh, so as you can see, it's 10, 11 centimeters long. It's something that you could really easily hide behind a, a network printer in a company. Uh, there's always a mess of cables behind that. and. Uh, it would draw very little power, so you could even uh, power it with a USB port of the printer or something like that. So uh, that company might have 802.1x making sure that only the printer is connecting to the switch. But so the switch would be here, for example, sending, okay, prove that you are the printer, and you just forward it to the other side, and the printer uh, proves itself, so you just forward it on the other side, and now the switch is happy. So now you are in the network, both the printer and the hacker, and uh, well, 802.1x is defeated. And uh, one, that's, one aspect of 802.1x that's even worse is this uh, Mac authentication barrier pass. It's a mode where you can say, just uh, for example, the printer, it actually doesn't really support 802.1x. So uh, on certain switch ports that uh, are configured maybe as a whole in the company, the company would have decided to deploy 802.1x everywhere, uh, but for some devices that don't support it, they would enable this MAB, authentication bypass, and uh, then it means basically, well, uh, um, it's just checking the MAC address, which we have seen on the previous slide. You can easily fake, etc. So you would even read it from a sticker on the printer or something, and uh, there you are connected. No need to have a fancy hardware like that. Well, fancy, that's like $150, so that's, that's really not that fancy. Um, then um, a way of correctly doing port-based uh, network access control is MACSEC, but uh, that's a fairly new standard and unfortunately not widely adopted. Um, so it's uh, sort of like the same idea as uh, 802.1x, where you connect uh, your cable and the switch starts uh, challenging you, but it doesn't stop at the very beginning. Once it's happy, it gives you the whole access to the network. It uh, actually, you can even use encryption between the switch and uh, the device connected at the other end of the cable. Uh, the problem, however, as I said, it's uh, not that uh, widely supported, especially I couldn't even find a printer that supports it. Uh, whereas IPsec, for example, which I'm getting to, is uh, part of IPv6. So uh, if a printer supports IPv6, like uh, most uh, business printers do, then it would definitely support IPsec. And again, of course, uh, you have to renew all your networking hardware to get that uh, MacSec support. So uh, then, uh, of course, um, let's say maybe the hacker uh, didn't uh, get into the network uh, by uh, defeating uh, those uh, switch partitionings or 802.1q or 802.1x or MACSEC or whatever. Um, but uh, there's still a way of messing with the network at the IP layer. So on the internet, uh, I wrote a, a tool a long time ago that was part of Backtrack for some time where you could uh, see if you were able to forge uh, packets from uh, your network. Uh, but uh, better yet, there's a whole, uh, uh, I forget, is it Center for Advanced Internet Data Research or something, sorry, I, I forgot the name, but uh, uh, they were monitoring all the IP spoofing on the internet, and that's typically done by uh, denial of service attacks. They don't, they usually would prefer, the hackers would usually prefer uh, that uh, you don't see where the attack is coming from, but uh, more and more internet service providers 
check that uh, when you, what you are sending to the internet looks like an IP address that's actually part of the network. So if you are spoofing the IP address, they would just drop the packet. But, um, so it's trickier on the internet, but inside a private network or LAN or one or whatever, it's, uh, it can be as easy as just taking the IP address of the printer here. Um, so of course, if you take it at the same time as the printer is still on, then you create an IP conflict in the network. Um, but maybe as a, uh, an attacker, you turned it off or you changed the IP on the printer, so you can still get around that. Or otherwise, okay, maybe you don't uh, um, abuse the IP address of the printer, you just leave it to uh, something else. So for example, this uh, address resolution protocol that we were discussing uh, earlier, it's uh, also not secure. Uh, most of the, uh, all those protocols were invented before security was a concern. So the way it works, when um, ARP, uh, so those are only replies here for simplicity, but um, if you remember at the beginning, a computer needs to know what address card, uh, what network card uh, has a certain IP address. So it would ask the whole network to ask uh, who has uh, this uh, 47.1, for example. And then uh, the computer that has 47.1 is supposed to reply and say, yes, I have it at this address and so on, dot two is at this address, and so on. So that works nicely as long as uh, no one is messing with it. But of course, if you look below the blue line, then here comes a hacker. You see the same MAC address on the right side claiming to be dot one, dot two, dot 200, and dot 254, uh, most likely the router. So you can easily pretend to be everyone or whoever on the network using ARP cache poisoning. Um, so okay, maybe you didn't do it at that level. So if you go further up, uh, that's uh, what uh, Per is going to talk about uh, in a while. Uh, but um, also DNS itself is not secure. So uh, if you are being uh, uh, what is called a man in the middle, so intercepting and modifying the traffic of uh, someone going to the internet, for example, and you tell them, well, actually, download.com is 10.6.syntaxis, uh, then their computer is going to say, well, okay, uh, they don't see any difference. Same thing with IPv6. You can make it uh, funny, like bad disease, dead, whatever, um, IPv6 address. So there's nothing in DNS that uh, says this is legit or this is forged. There's no difference in it. That's what DNSSEC is for, and that's what uh, Pear is going to talk about. But uh, the problem, of course, with it is that uh, it's not widely used yet. So uh, uh, even funnier, if you haven't, uh, if you think all the attacks that I only skimmed, uh, because there's even more than that, so really uh, local networking is crazy. Uh, but um, an even easier one to do is that uh, web proxy auto discovery protocol. Uh, if you remember at the beginning, that computer that was uh, several times per second asking, is anyone the WPAD server? Um, so it's continuously asking everyone, basically, does anyone want my web traffic? So if you are a hacker, you say, yeah, sure, send it to me. Um, and then um, it's perhaps tricky to mess with the HTTPS traffic, but there's still plenty that uh, goes in the clear, like, uh, um, this, uh, I chose download.com, one of the most popular download websites for a reason also, is that um, what you download from it is not over HTTPS, it's over plain HTTP. So let's say a hacker just pretends to be in this network now, pretends to be the WPAD uh, server, so basically your own proxy, they can modify what uh, that installer program that you downloaded and uh, put a virus in it or spyware or whatever. Uh, and um, that's by default, so really check your computers. It's in default in IE, Firefox, from VirtualBox, etc. So as I was saying, this all works uh, as long as no one is messing with it, but basically this is how your trust in the network looks like. Uh, you can really tackle it at any point. So would you still run that uh, downloaded uh, Avast, uh, that's the number one download from download.com, as you can see coming from HTTP. 
And uh, well, uh, I use Linux, so it would have opened it with wine, but uh, with everything that I have showed you so far, at, there's so many different ways that this antivirus is actually going to install a virus for you. So then you would say, okay, well, uh, we have solved that problem. There's uh, HTTPS and um, actually the whole protocol behind it, that uh, SSL or TLS. But uh, as Per would say, it's only one part or a couple of parts. You have still many other protocols that uh, you would have to secure and double check that, for example, uh, developers in a company network are not setting up some uh, wiki or intranet sites that uh, ask you for your domain password uh, in HTTP instead of HTTPS and so on. Uh, there's um, also all the network shares, you know, Samba or NFS, etc. That's all in the clear unless you, I'm not even sure it's possible to encrypt them directly. There's a, a way in uh, Windows uh, Active Directory group policies that you can have some sort of integrity checks on the network shares but it's still not encrypted as far as I know. So maybe a hacker wouldn't be able to um, modify uh, documents that you are sharing, but they could at least see uh, what uh, you think uh, was only between you and the colleague. Actually, a um, uh, hacker that doesn't have access to this sensitive project, for example, they would still be able to see all your documents. Um, so as I was saying, often you have some little websites that are set up by teams uh, on their own and they have uh, HTTP uh, basic authentication or well, um, doesn't, uh, well, all kinds of passwords transmitted in the clear. You also have all kinds of uh, protocols that you are not sure are really secure. So some local instant messaging app or all these new um, team collaboration um, uh, protocols. And uh, a funny one is, uh, these uh, hashes sent to attackers. So uh, you might have heard recently of uh, um, the LAN turtle and uh, what Sami Kam Kamkar did with um, uh, Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, an equivalent where basically when you connect a USB thing to a Windows computer that pretends to be a USB network card uh, and then Windows, even if the machine is locked, Windows is happy to have discovered this new network and it will uh, start to uh, try to use it. And notably, it's going to try to find a domain controller or a network shares, etc. And um, what you can do is you say, yeah, yeah, I'm the server, the file server with uh, those network shares. And then Windows to try to mount that network share is going to send a hash of your password so that uh, what normally that a Windows file server would do would be verify that uh, you have indeed the right to access that folder, but when it's an attacker, it means now they have a hash to put into Hashcat or John the Ripper, etc. So that, that's really funny to do. Uh, so that's why today I want to talk about IPsec, which really is not only for VPNs. That's uh, what most people know it for, but uh, you will see it's not solving all the problems uh, in security, of course, but uh, it should solve or at least make it much better than everything I have uh, skimmed over so far. So the idea is, uh, um, so instead of having to worry about all those different uh, HTTP, um, DNS, or whatever insecure protocols, you just put a secure layer below all of them, which is IP. So that's why it's called IPsec for security of IP. Uh, then uh, there's uh, different components to it. Uh, part uh, the authentication header is uh, you can use only that part. For example, if you for some reason you only want uh, clear uh, you want clear text transmissions, but uh, make sure that no one modifies them for some reason if you want. Or uh, most importantly, you would probably use this. Uh, encapsulated security payload, which uh, encrypts. So especially uh, you don't want to have uh, encryption without uh, authentication or uh, sorry, integrity, uh, so that um, even if it's encrypted and a hacker cannot uh, read uh, directly what's being exchanged, it's not good if a hacker is able to mess with your encrypted traffic. So you would usually use a combination of VSP and AH. And also another option that's part of IPsec, I've never seen it used, but uh, just so you know, you can even do compression with it. 
So that's uh, what uh, you normally see when people say IPsec, it's uh, usually simply VPN, so um, typically between uh, two different uh, locations of a company or uh, from a, someone working from home and uh, they want the laptop to be part of the company network to access the intranet, etc. So what's happening um, is you would have, for example, at home your Ethernet or Wi-Fi layer and then IPsec is a uh, the green part means encrypted. So whatever it's carrying inside, it's going to be protected by that uh, green layer. So that's how then you send that to the other side of the network. Uh, so the other branch office or the, you're working from home to the company. You send a whole IP packet with whatever it was. So maybe you are trying to access the intranet. So it's IP, TCP, HTTP. And um, the gray part means it's insecure. But uh, since it's protected at least uh, in that envelope, then it's fine so far. Um, so in real life, actually, because uh, everyone now has uh, cheap networking equipment at home that's uh, uh, not supporting all protocols on the internet, etc., they are basically use, uh, using only, uh, supporting only TCP and UDP, basically, uh, for the um, network address translation. So that's when you are sharing your internet connection between several computers, as you would do now typically between your laptop, your mobile phone, and so on. Um, and because then the uh, router would be confused between uh, what uh, IP traffic, it wouldn't be able to redirect that uh, directly to all the different computers. So what's uh, typically done is uh, this uh, huge overhead of uh, encapsulating everything into UDP and then uh, the same that I was showing just before. So that's uh, called uh, IPsec tunnel. It's when you have a whole IP packet inside of IPsec. That's what uh, people are most fam uh, familiar with. But what I want to talk about today mostly is the IPsec transport, meaning you can completely replace the IP layer here with IPsec basically so that uh, you can have your inside your home network, why not? But uh, especially inside uh, your company network, all the computers that are talking to each other, so the client workstations to the servers and so on, or maybe between clients uh, workstations as well, uh, it should not be in the clear anymore. You should uh, have this uh, bottom layer that's uh, uh, just above Ethernet, of course, but um, that's uh, securing everything that you put on top of it. So it doesn't really matter anymore if uh, you have some developers doing a little website in the corner that's asking for passwords in clear text because the password will be sent in clear text in that box here, but it's encrypted by the outer layer. As opposed to, oh yeah, it's actually not gray, sorry. It's red, uh, couldn't see from here. Um, so yeah, that's the state of uh, most networks now, unfortunately. So everything is insecure, basically. You have insecure Ethernet and everything I was presenting so far. So you, a hacker can mess with any of this, as opposed to this. So this is, let's say, a typical network. Um, and in white, uh, it's uh, computers that are not configured to use IPsec. So let's say clear text uh, computers and they communicate with each other and so on. So what happens most of the time is uh, this IPsec tunnel between a branch office here in some location and another office here in another location. So they still use two networks that are completely unencrypted. They just have this link between two gateways, two routers that's encrypting here so that uh, the NSA or some hacker at some uh, service provider does not look inside the traffic. But the reality is that the hackers, they are here anyway. So um, that's the idea of uh, using IPsec transport. You have the same um, company network or home network, if you want. And uh, all the colored nodes are now using encryption. And that would be a hacker in the middle or, for some reason, a computer that was not yet configured. So for example, a uh, contractor that just arrived and connected to the wrong cable, they cannot understand anything of uh, what's going on. They cannot mess with the traffic around. So one really cool thing that you can do now, um, 
instead of having to worry about uh, proper physical separation of all the networks, which is really hard to do when you have networks that have evolved over many years, everything is connected to everything and uh, you would have to pull out all the wires and redo everything. Actually, with IPsec, you don't have to. You can still leave everything connected with everything, but you make it so that uh, um, the different groups speak different languages if you want. So if you remember um, that uh, public infrastructure earlier, you would make it so that um, the green part would recognize certificates from a green uh, sub-certification authority that the other colors would not recognize. So that, for example, um, let's say the blue node here would uh, try to hack into the green computer here. Then the green computer would say, OK, uh, uh, prove yourself, uh, what's your certificate, etc. So the blue computer would maybe try to give its blue certificate, but the green computer doesn't trust that uh, green certification authority, so it would just reject it. And again, the hacker in the middle here doesn't know what's going on. So of course you would tell me, well, uh, company networks are not that simple. We actually need to have uh, links between uh, different groups. Uh, you need to access uh, printers and the canteen website and everything. And uh, that's still possible. It's actually even better than what you could do with firewalls now because uh, if you remember what I was showing about uh, that uh, um, house of cards or cards castle, um, when you do packet filtering with firewalls, you're still trusting that whole house of cards. So you don't know if uh, actually any of it has been spoofed. Whereas here with IPsec, you can really enforce proper firewalling because here that uh, cyan uh, firewall here, it's, it's a cyan as a mix of uh, blue and green because it would understand both those uh, kinds of IPsec, let's say. Um, but also there's no way that uh, blue here, even uh, by changing its IP address or forging DNS or whatever uh, they would try, they could not communicate with the green one. They would still have to go through the cyan gateway. And then the gateway, uh, once it's decrypted, uh, you apply firewall rules here and um, then uh, there's no way that the traffic was uh, messed with or forged because it was, it's only um, encrypted and signed by the real author. And uh, of course then, what if you have uh, printers or TVs or whatever devices that do not support IPsec? There are still uh, uh, some devices. Big printers usually support it, but uh, maybe yes, like I was saying, an Xbox for some reason or whatever. And especially the rest of the internet here, uh, you wouldn't connect to Facebook or uh, Amazon directly with IPsec. However, it would be much better to not have the hacker here be able to mess with all your internet traffic when you're downloading those, uh, like, uh, what was it, Avira or whatever antivirus from the internet inside the company network, and now you're installing that as administrator, but it's actually spyware, etc. So at least you would have all that secured directly to the border of your network here with a gateway that speaks all the different kinds of IPsec here. And, uh, and then making it unencrypted for normal um, other networks like printers or the internet. Um, so some excuses you will hear from people saying, oh no, IPsec, it's uh, actually such an overhead on CPUs, etc." That's really not true anymore. There's a hardware acceleration of AES. Also in terms of uh, overhead onto the packets, uh, it's also negligible, especially on uh, gigabit networks, you should be using jumbo frames anyway, which are up to 9,000 bytes. So it's really not going to slow down your downloads, your file transfers. Um, you could make it even better if you store the private keys inside hardware security modules that uh, most computers already have as part of the trusted platform mo uh, module. And uh, if it doesn't have a TPM, I think actually those Nitro keys are made in Bochum. So it's a 49 euros hardware security module on USB, etc. So of course, not something that you would put somewhere where there's a risk that someone would pull the USB thing, but it's also better than nothing for some router board somewhere in an enclosure or something. Um, then with TPM and uh, some IPsec uh, stacks like StrongSwan, you can do remote attestation, which is 
a way of uh, securely verifying that uh, no one has messed uh, with the operating system on the other side, which you would uh, typically do between two uh, VPN gateways, for example, to make sure that uh, maybe someone didn't modify the operating system. And uh, to take it even further, you can uh, make sure that uh, even uh, if, uh, for example, in that uh, blue network, you have a different blue computers here. Um, unfortunately, I think Windows still doesn't support it, but you could have, so for example, the blue computer here couldn't pretend to be a green or red computer, which is already great if you have different uh, sensitive network, classified networks, etc. But you could still have the blue computer here pretend to be this one, and you don't really want that. So there's a, an extension called uh, uh, X509 V3 IP address, which is recognized by uh, Linux and other Unices, or BSD at least, but um, Windows uh, doesn't really support it, so it would still be fooled by uh, uh, what I was just showing about the two uh, blue computers, but uh, Linux and BSD wouldn't. So um, that was a lot to take in. I guess uh, I tried to stay as simple as possible, but uh, feel free to ask me questions now or come later on if you have some questions that come to mind. Any questions?